Hey St. Catharines, Mayor Matt Sisko here back with episode three of Talk STC. Exciting episode coming up, a bunch of things to get to, lots of, uh, lots of good things that have been going on since the last time I was with you. Uh, I do want to just very briefly thank all of those who were in attendance at my State of the City address. Uh, the Greater Niagara Chamber of Commerce had me over at Club Roma to, uh, to speak to a crowd of about 400 people. Uh, it was an exciting opportunity for me to lay out the vision and the path that we're looking at as we uh, go through the next four years. Uh, I'm very blessed to be the Mayor of St. Catharines. I have a bunch of ideas and I have a great council, a great staff at City Hall uh, that are ready to support those ideas and keep us moving forward. So again, and I want to thank the Greater Niagara Chamber of Commerce. If you did not have a chance to, uh, to be there, you do have an opportunity to catch it here on your TV next week, Monday at 7 p.m., Tuesday at 8 p.m., and Friday at 7 p.m. There will be a replay of the Mayor's State of the City Address. So looking forward uh, to the feedback I get from the community all about uh, the things that we talked about. Uh, a lot of talk about housing, obviously. That's been a big focus of the provincial government. That's a big focus of uh, St. Catharines City Council and of Niagara Regional Council. Uh, a lot of talk about that housing affordability issues uh, and also the other you know, major social issues that are going on in our community, talking a lot about those. Today's episode is exciting because we're going to delve into uh, to one of those big issues with my first guest. Today on the episode, we're going to have Carla Stout, who's the general manager of the Niagara Region Transit. She's my first guest today. Carla, thank you for coming in. Thank you for having me. And then once you and I are finished talking, I'm going to have the opportunity to talk to Tyler Bealby. He is the head coach of the St. Catharines Junior B Falcons. The Falcons are in the midst of another playoff push this year. We're going to have a great conversation with him all about the team, the playoffs, uh, and the history of the St. Catharines Falcons. But up first... Carla, I do, uh, do thank you for coming in today. Carla is the first general manager of the new Niagara Region Transit. Uh, she uh, educated in public administration and local government management mm -hmm. and 20 years of working here in Niagara, progressively higher roles uh, and really digging into the transit industry and, uh, and now leading us forward. So Carla, again, thank you for coming in. Uh, before we get started, give me a little bit of your background. I have a brief bio, but tell me how did you wind up in the position you're in now. How did I wind up doing this? Um, I started in local government working for municipalities about 25 years ago. Um, I progressively started to take on small little contracted services that uh, for smaller municipalities meant that they had either fixed route transit or they had specialized transit. And I really kind of learned the business from the ground up from creating it in small communities to running it for a large city like Niagara Falls. Um, when this opportunity uh, came forward during the amalgamation, um, I was absolutely pleased and honored to, to take this first team of the Niagara Region Transit that came together in the amalgamation forward. I love the ground up education experience. I think mm -hmm. that's the best way to learn a job is to start from you know the grassroots and just build out from that. So I love that that's your background. Mm -hmm. Listen, so, Niagara Transit Commission was stood up uh, January 1st. Service began as an amalgamated, integrated transit system. But give me a little bit of background. I was lucky enough, I had a front row seat. Uh, I got to chair the Linking Niagara Transit Committee. But tell me, you know, and give the viewers at home, what, what, did, what did it take for us to get here? Oh my gosh. So it, it took decades. And it, it, took a lot of, uh, it took a lot of hard graft from people, you know, 10, 20 years ago to start this process. Um, you had people either, you know, politically or in the community or, you know, from outreach and social services, identifying a need for seamless transportation across Niagara. Transportation will constantly be called out as one of the four determinants of health in Niagara. Um, and in, in the structure that it was in 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, when the intermunicipal transit system started in its pilot kind of phase, um, it was insufficient. And it was insufficient for Niagarans um, to access healthcare as hospitals started to close, to access jobs. Um, you have jobs that are kind of smattered around the region depending on their seasonality, depending on, you know, whether they're part-time or full-time opportunities, if they're in manufacturing, they're mostly in the larger centers and that really pre-qualified a lot of people in the region from those opportunities. So that's identified as an issue, but what do you do about it? And 
over time through organizations like the municipalities and you know them working uh, with the communities that they, they serve, um, but also with um, you know transit itself, working on things like the IMT working group, you know, which was all of the transit professionals in the region, and the linking Niagara Transit uh, Committee, uh, which was your CAOs and your mayors, you know, from across Niagara. Um, they really pulled it kind of all together and provided an opportunity for the region to take a proposal forward to all of the municipalities and at regional council to say, I think we're ready to do this. We're ready to pull the pin on this. And if everybody agrees, we're gonna go. And that was the triple majority process that everybody talks about this triple majority process. And it's not, it's not complicated, it, it really wasn't. It was the most of the Niagara municipalities had to agree representing the most of the people in Niagara. And that was pretty much it. Once we got there, then the road forward was, how are we gonna stand this up by January 1st, 2023? And, and make sure that operations were underway. Yeah, and I mean, it was an overwhelming majority of councils, overwhelming majority of councillors. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had the opportunity of being a part of a couple of those votes, seeing some of those votes, and there was a lot of enthusiasm. So we've got here, yep. it's been three months now, how have the first three months of service been going? Service is great. Yeah. Um, service was uninterrupted, and that was that was absolutely our focus for day one. The last thing you want is everything to come crumbling down on day one. Uh, that didn't happen. Uh, we have a lot of great uh, teams and transit professionals across the region who you know put it all together from the back of the house and and made sure that the buses were still coming to the stop on time. Um, and we even managed to roll out um, a few. Uh, a few new things for the riders, um, you know, a harmonized payment, you know, uh, fare product, as well as um, our new mobile ticketing. Uh, mobile ticketing isn't new to St. Catharines. St. Catharines has enjoyed that for a while, um, but we were able to roll it out across the system for Niagara, which was fantastic. And the uptick on that has been amazing. That's phenomenal. Yeah. So. And that raises something interesting when it comes to ticketing. Uh, something that's been in the media a fair amount in the last couple of days, at least, uh, talking about affordability versus fare evasion. In yeah. Toronto, I know they're having issues with fare evasion, and there's lots of talk about ticketing people who, uh, who try to avoid paying their fares. Give me an idea, when you talk about those two concepts, affordability and fare, what's the difference? Like, how are they related to one another, and what's the plan in Niagara? Sure. So. Affordability is, is your ability to pay. What can you afford to pay to get on board, to get on the bus, to take a trip with us? Fare evasion is you either have no ability to pay or you have, you're not going to pay. You have no intent to pay at the fare box. Um, and those are two different things and those are two different people that, you know, that we have getting on board currently. Um, the affordability piece is, is work that we have to do. And we recognize that. We, we're putting together a, a fair structure um, that, you know, albeit is you know, fairly affordable, really at $3 a trip for local and $6 you know, for that intermunicipal cross-boundary bus ride. Um, but it isn't affordable for everyone. Mm -hmm. And public service and, and particularly public transit um, should be affordable for everyone and and I believe that my team believes that and we're pretty sure that the board feels that way at the Transit Commission so we're going to be bringing something forward to them um, that is based on best practice across Canada that really looks at meeting Niagarans where they are and providing them with a product that doesn't necessarily have them have to be on any sort of um, social income uh, to receive what I would consider a discounted pass. Um, it, it could be something as simple as a pass geared to income, uh, much like regional housing works. Um, so that's something that we're definitely going to be bringing forward. Fair evasion is a different, it's a different concept and it's a different conversation and it's going to be part of some pretty hard conversations that we're going to have to have in Niagara. Um, we have significant um, numbers of folks in our communities now that are struggling and they struggle with mental health 
um, they struggle with addiction, um, they are houseless. So a lot of those folks, they can't pay. Mm -hmm. um, during COVID and during the pandemic, when we weren't taking fares on board, a lot of these folks got very used to getting on the buses and not being asked to present a fare or to provide anything in payment. Um, and that seems to have consistently just kind of continued on. Um, it's creating an issue on our buses for, for our fare paying customers who don't feel that it is fair yeah. that they've paid to be on the bus and, and they're watching people walk right past the fare box. Um, but that's, those are hard conversations and, and those are conversations that we wanna have with social agencies and outreach networks to understand how can we support people and still give them something to present at the box if they are organized in outreach in Niagara. If, if they're not making any, if they're not making any, um, I don't know what the word is, uh, effort, yeah. I guess, to, to, you know, get services or be involved in local programs or whatever, and they just want to get on the bus and stay on the bus for six hours and be warm. That's not what we provide. Yeah. So, like I said, it's going to be some hard conversations. I think we're going to be involving the right people to talk about that. I don't think Niagara is at a place like the TTC where we have to have transit police. I don't think we need enforcement. I think we need education and we need outreach. Yeah, and I yeah. think that's the key is to make sure that we're educating and we're, we're getting out to those social agencies and involving yep. them in this process as well. I agree. Yep. So we've made these steps, you mm -hmm. know, we've, uh, we've gone through three months now of this integrated service, services are working well. Let's blue sky things, I like to <laughs> blue sky things. 10 years from now, what does the fleet look like? What does the service look like? What sort of changes do you foresee coming in the next 10 years that are gonna make transit uh, an ever more viable opportunity for people in the community? A, a 10 year horizon. Um, so what I would picture for for transit in Niagara would be a one fare transit system. Yep. So no longer a two tiered uh, transit trip. Um, it would be a one fare in Niagara. Um, we're gonna have had an opportunity to go through um, a facility review to really understand what we need for, for buildings and for terminals and for hubs and things like that across Niagara. And we'll be, we'll be getting building on all of those things and, and using up some of those provincial and federal dollars that we've qualified for. With the fleet, um, the fleet is only ever gonna go one way from here. The yeah. fleet is going to have to be greened. Um, it's going to be a challenge for us uh, with how fast does that happen and in what format. There's a lot of different opportunities to green fleets. Um, it's not just an electric game. Um, here in Niagara, we're building a, a hydrogen hub uh, in Niagara Falls. That's, that's an opportunity that we'd like to explore. Um, there's um, RNG, CNG, natural gas, um, engines that we can look at to reduce greenhouse gases as well and become more green. Um, but, you know, one of the things that could be standing in the way of, of that is just the cost of the vehicles at this point. Certainly post-pandemic, we're, we're being challenged with, you know, 15 to 20% increases in the cost of a bus yeah. uh, within a year. So, um, you know, that definitely puts a little bit of a pall on our plans for that. but. But it doesn't slow us down any. We we have every intention to uh, to have a green fleet absolutely in Niagara. The 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 horizon question for ten years of of what does it actually look like? Um, what I see is is basically like a hub and spoke model here in Niagara, and yeah. I see um, you know a, a harmonized. Uh, specialized and on-demand system that really serves people where they're at either in their mobility or where they're at in a rural or a smaller community in Niagara mm -hmm. and brings them into the larger systems and those larger systems you know 10 years from now will have gone through two iterations of master planning yeah you know so we we've got a lot on our plate um, but it's nothing that we're not excited about Oh, that's fantastic. And I, I'm looking forward to the changes. I was very uh, lucky to be uh, appointed as the chair of mm -hmm. the Niagara Transit Commission. So I'm looking forward to uh, the next four years 
uh, and the governance review that comes from that. But I'm looking forward to the next four years and working with you and your team, along with the rest of uh, what I think is going to be an amazing commission to, to move transit forward here in Niagara. So Carla, thank you so much for coming in today. And Thanks for having me. Definitely. Uh, coming up next, we're going to be talking to Tyler Bilby, the head coach of the St. Catharines Falcons, on their playoff run in the midst of a big playoff push right now. Uh, so we we'll look forward to seeing you right after the break. Welcome back, St. Catharines. We're going to change gears quite considerably. We had a great chat about transit, but now we're going to move over and we are going to chat with Tyler Bealby, the head coach of the St. Catharines Junior B Falcons. Tyler, thanks for joining me here today. Thanks for having me, Mr. Mayor. It's an exciting time for the Falcons. You just finished off a uh, first round sweep of the Pelham Panthers, and now we're looking for your second opponent. Uh, when's the series expected to start? Uh, as early as next week. Not sure on the exact date. Still waiting for another series to, to finish up, but uh, could be as early as Wednesday, could be as, as late as Friday of next week. This is the issue when you sweep a team and everybody else is taking a little bit of extra time to try and get through the first round. Yeah, well, we'll if we call it an issue, we'll take it. Uh, the little extra rest and, and time never hurts. Exactly. Uh, so listen, before we get into talking about the team, I, I need to understand this. And I'll, my own background, 15 years as a teacher, now the yeah. mayor. My understanding is 15 years as an insurance agent, now the head coach of the Junior B Falcons. How does that happen? Yeah, so I, I'm still very much an insurance broker, and it's been now the better part of, of, of 20 years. So in my young 20s, I joined uh, Young's Insurance, which is a, a regional brokerage here in, uh, in the area. And uh, I just, I never, I never stopped uh, loving the game. And so when I was done playing my junior hockey, I, I coached uh, on the side at the minor hockey level back when the Welland uh, Tigers had a AAA center. And uh, I spent my time there at night and, and my days at, at the insurance office. And um, through the, you know, 15 years of, of being around good hockey people, it, it led to opportunities and, and then led to a conversation with Frank Gurney, our, our current GM, that, that has me where I am today. That's amazing. Yeah. I, I love the grassroots building up through, you know, the sport. Mm -hmm. That's the way, the best way to wind up with coaches, I think, people that have been there all the way through. Play, yeah. Playing career before? Yeah, it, it wasn't uh, It wasn't a very high-level playing career. I played some junior hockey in, in Dunville, played my AAA hockey growing up in, in Welland. Um, but, you know, I always played the game because I really loved it. I had really supporting parents that, that, that didn't pound down on me too much over the game and wanted to make sure that I was there for the right reasons. And, and I think that's what led me to coaching because I wasn't ready to be done with the game. And it brought me back to uh, uh, the food festival in Welland on, on a, September, a September evening. And a bunch of young guys walked by me in, in track suits the year I'd finished playing hockey. And it just hit me. It hit me that this was going to be the first September that I didn't have a, a training camp to, to attend. And so as a result, I made a phone call the next day and, and, and started coaching right then and there and, and haven't looked back since. So Mudcat to Tiger to Falcon. Yeah, we were, we were the Terriers at the time. Um, <laughs> but uh, there's no question that Mudcats is, is, is the history in that, that city. And uh, exactly. That's okay. exactly right. So talking about history, yeah. the Junior B history in St. Catharines. So I'm going to try and go through this and yep. then you can fill in some gaps for me. Incorporated in 1968, the yep. St. Catharines Falcons come to be 19 Golden Horseshoe Championships, two Sutherland Cups in 54 years, including last year. Yep. Um, more than a thousand players who've worn the red and white, three first round NHL draft choices, Brian Bellows, who was a second overall, Riley Sheehan, who was 21st overall, and then Dalton LeVay, 29th overall, uh, who was like, the first junior B player drafted directly to the NHL. So here's my question. What did you know about that history before you came to the Falcons? Uh, I... Well, I, I grew up, I should be careful because I grew up in Welland and, and I, that's where I really fell in love with this league is, is Sunday nights in Welland watching um, Junior B hockey games. And, you know, St. Catharines always come into town and, and they were always a very strong team. And it was always from an early age, everybody always talked about the organization uh, and the way they handle their business. And, and so I did, I, I had a feeling that there was a lot of history and, and I knew about that coming in and it's also why I wanted to be a part of the organization. Um, because, you know, it's important that we put these young men first, is, is we're there to win hockey games, of course. Uh, but I also think we play a bigger role in the village and I know that St. Catharines had, had always taken pride on that side of things and their relationship with Brock University and making sure your players are either students or working full time and, you know, not sitting at home um, on video game consoles all day. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I was always drawn to the history of St. Catharines and in particular the Jack uh, Gatecliff Arena. Wow, Jack Gatecliff Arena. So I, uh, 
I, it's almost like you're tailor making these segues for me. <laughs> this is your first year out of the Jack. This is the first yep. year the Falcons have been to Seymour Hanna. What's that transition been like? Uh, it, you know, like anything, change is, is difficult, and, and everybody has an opinion on change. There's no question. Um, you go from a, a real historic arena full of character uh, to a newer, a newer build. Uh, you get to enjoy the amenities of the, the newer build, but you miss the character uh, yeah. of, of the old rink. Um, but it's been a great transition, and that's because of the village and the organization and the board of directors and all the volunteers that, that spend their time um, trying to add value to the team uh, outside the dressing room. And, and they've done a, a great, great job trying to create a, a great uh, game day uh, operation over at the Seymour. And, and we're starting to see those fans come in, and it's been great. Well, and this is, I had a chance to be at the last game against Pelham. And uh, I will say, it's, nothing can recreate the Jack. It's yep. just a very unique building. That's correct. Uh, but, you know, being nice and close to the ice the way you are in rink one at Seymour Hanna, I think maybe there's a possibility that that enthusiasm can carry over and be maintained because yeah. it can get loud in there. It sure can. I think, and, and Mr. Mayor, I think we're feeling that right now. Um, we've seen a, an increase in, in attendance over the last few weeks in particular, uh, and the players have made comments about how great it is uh, to hear the fans. And, and our fans in St. Catharines are the best in league. Um, they're they're they travel well. They're at our, you know, I probably have a better part of 100 people on the road. Yeah. We can hear their cowbells. And uh, I also chalk, uh, uh, you know, their support up to a big reason we're successful because the young guys feel like they have a village behind them. Yeah, I know I've had the opportunity to get to know the leadership over at the yeah. Falcons. And I, it's a great organization of people that clearly want the best for, you know, the, the gentlemen who are playing for the team, but the organization as a whole. Yeah. Like, they want to move it forward, and that's been phenomenal. I'm, so give a little bit of insight. Junior B, a lot of people don't think about, you know, players from Junior B going to the NHL, but that's not the reality. Like there's there's a pretty decent contingent of kids who wind up playing at the highest Absolute, level. Ab absolutely. And everybody has a, a little bit of a different route. You know, sometimes you're drafted to the OHL, but you may you still may need to mature physically a bit. Um, so you have to spend a year, you know, but it doesn't mean you're not, you don't have that OHL skill set. And, and um, there's also no, you know, tier two, uh, junior A down in our loop mm -hmm. in, in the region. So, um, you know, I would, I would beg to differ that the, a lot of the players and a lot of the, the teams in our league are junior A type teams. And that's why you see these guys move on to the next level. You know, our captain Jonah Boria this year is, is already committed with uh, Brock University. And for those that don't know, especially in St. Catharines, that is the most hidden gem hockey that there is. Uh, it, it, the, the level of competition is is worth every dollar you'll pay for a ticket there and, and and we're excited to have jonah go there and spend the next few years uh, representing them well i think it's fantastic that he's staying in the community and yeah. you're right and brock hockey and cis hockey in general is pretty fantastic to watch yeah. as well yeah. um as for your season 38 6 and 6 yeah. uh first in the is it go jhl can you say that or is this go G the go jhl i've heard it referred to as the jungle it's ha it has a lot of different names but, all right uh, so the goge the goge first in the goge um what were the keys this year what what got you to where you were we talked a lot and and we talked a lot about you know this saying in particular stay humble and stay hungry and and, and for a couple of reasons you know you win so you need to stay humble right because uh, you can't get too ahead of yourself and and because you also won, you need to stay hungry and you can't be satisfied. And right from the beginning of training camp, you know, we turned over uh, the better part of 11 players, I believe. And that was the message. You know, the guys that are returning, you need to stay hungry for the new guys. And the new guys that are coming in, you need to stay hungry to give the guys that want another opportunity uh, to, to win, it, win again. And I think that that mindset has been very, very important to our success this year. Because it's not easy having a, a strong year and then coming back and, and finishing in, in first place. And um, I credit that all to those young men that put the skates on. I can put the work in, my coaches can put the work in, but we don't put the skates on. It's those young men and they're the ones that after a, a prolonged season last year had to show up this year and find a way to get up every year. And they did, they did a great job and, and they, they came together as a unit early on. And, for the most part of the season, we were in first place. Well, and this is, you know, you expect in junior hockey, there's going to be ebbs and flows, right? Yeah. You, you yeah. have, as your team gets older and more experienced, they're going to they're going to go have better seasons, but then you get younger. That didn't happen to you guys. No, no. And, and, and you know, I, I'll still I'll lean back to culture. It, it starts at the beginning of the season, and it's something we, we take a great deal of pride in. And, it, and, you know, I build a lot of trust in relationships, in particular with the 20-year-olds, the older guys on the team. And 
uh, making sure that they're here for the right reasons. You know, some of them are living in student housing over at Brock. They have other things going on in life. Uh, but you're not here to just be here. We're here to, to be successful and win and help the younger guys along. So I make sure that, that my pulse is uh, active and close uh, with the older guys. And I think that's a big part. We've been able to create the culture that we have. Well, it seems to be working. You're on your quest for your second straight Sutherland Cup. Um, when you look across uh, the rest of the playoff series, where are the biggest concerns? Um, I think, you know, you have to look back to why we were successful last year. We were a very disciplined team. So I don't want to call it a concern. I just want to say that it's something we'll, we'll always be mindful of. If you want to be the last one standing, it, 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 it involves a great deal of emotional intelligence, strong emotional intelligence, discipline. Uh, and making sure that, that we don't put too much emphasis on the name on the back of the jersey this time of year. Uh, it is about the crest. It is about that Falcons crest. It is about the history uh, going back to 1968. Do you have one moment this year, one play, anything that stands out in your mind, the thing you're going, that's why I do this. That's the reason why I'm behind this bench. Yeah, it was a great moment. Um, a player of mine who has also been named the uh, Athlete of the Year in St. Catharines, Mitchell Armstrong, had a, had a great great uh, year you know won gold medal with lacrosse uh, brought brock to a national championship lacrosse won a southern cup with us and uh, i had asked him a couple times before our, our manager had announced my award to the team if he had gotten an email from the city yet and uh, he said no and so we went on and the, the, my manager announced it without mentioning his award because we weren't sure yet um, that night i got a text message from mitchell that said i got an email from from the mayor um, and I said, okay, when'd you get it? Well, I got it this morning and I asked him why he didn't tell me. Uh, his message back very quickly was, uh, I want to win. It's not about me. It's about the team. And, and we're talking about a young man, 18 years old. He, he did not have that success by mistake. He is a winner through and through. Um, that stood out for me. It, 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 it really told me you guys uh, with the selection committee made the right decision there. He embodies uh, what winning and what an athlete should look like, the way he treats his teammates, his coaches, his friends, his family. And uh, that stood out because that's the real reason we spend the time we spend is, is to be a part of the village to help these young guys along. And uh, it doesn't look like he needs much of my help. Coach, I'm not going to lie, that story makes my chest want to explode. That's yeah. phenomenal. That's yeah. why you get into coaching right there. That's it. And, uh, you know, if that's a young man that's born and raised in St. Catharines and the future is bright if you have people like him around the city long term. Awesome. Tyler, thank you so much for uh, coming and chatting with us. We will be right back after this. St. Catharines, thank you for joining me on this episode of Talk STC. I want to say a sincere thank you to Carla Stout from the Niagara Transit Commission. Thank you to Tyler Bilby, the coach of the St. Catharines Junior B Falcons as they continue their playoff run. Hope you can join me with X as Talk STC right here on your TV next time. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful, wonderful night.